politics can be as unpredictable as the Wellington weather. The 2014 election saw an aspiring MP unexpectedly elected to Parliament on her party's list. The sassy mother of nine from Masterton became the fresh, new face of the Māori Party, taking Parliament by storm. But before long, the political winds shifted, and after just one term, Marama Fox was gone. Out of Parliament, but not out of things to say. Kia ora. I'm Morgan Godfrey. I'm a blogger, writer and commentator and I'm fascinated by New Zealand politics. Now, I'm speaking with former Māori MPs in Mātangirea, Parliament's historic Māori Affairs Committee room. I want to understand their place in our history and what we can learn from their political legacies. This is Ma Tangirea. Tēnei au, tēnei au, te uri o Ngāti Porau, o Ngāti Kahungunu, o ngā wahine, a tāhua nei, a niniwa i te rangi, me o kukuia o Ngāti Porau hoki, rātau e tu ana ki rungi te marae. A nei a hau, ko mārama. You're whited up a heart, you're from Masterton, but you grew up in Christchurch, is that right? Yeah, I know, right? Tell me about it. Well, it's a bit weird. I once spoke at the Waitangi Tribunal um, hearings for our people of Wairarapa, and I said to Carrie Wainwright, the judge at the time, that I experienced more racism in Masterton than in Christchurch, literally. And we went to some of the flashiest schools in Christchurch, um, but that was literally because my mother started play centre in the Purirua, in Waitangirua. And the Minister of Education at the time went to have a look at it. I was one year old. Uh, this was in 1971. We got shifted to Christchurch because he offered her a job on the spot, put her in the Ministry of Education or the Department of Education at the time as a preschool advisor. And so here was my mum showing them how to make a dodo and kono and doing stick games, all these Māori from Waitangirua at the time, um, parents, and playing these games with their kids. And so the minister thought that was amazing and gave her a job and we all shifted to Christchurch. I had, uh, my father was Pākehā and he was a teacher. And so for a very long time, he was, you know, the main breadwinner in the family. And now my mother earned more money than him and within two years he left. And my mother taught me that um, I can do anything because she sent me to junior mechanics so I could learn how to fix the lawnmower, change the spark plugs in the engine on the car, change a tyre, check the oil, do all those sorts of things, because it was just us. The second lesson she taught me was that I needed to be better than my best. She literally sat me down and said, Marama, you're Māori, you're a young woman, and you are at the bottom of every statistic in this country. You have to be better than better. And so I came home, I think I was about nine, and I got 99% in my maths test. And I go, Mum, I got 99%. And she said, she looked at me and she goes, what did you do wrong? I'm like, I got 99%, Mum. She goes, yeah, have you worked out what you did wrong yet? Why do you think you experienced more racism when you came home to Masterton than you did down in Christchurch? Christchurch, they say, what school do you go to? Because they want to see how much money you earned. And depending on what school you went to, depended on where you lived and therefore what your income was. It's stupid, but that's what they do. But there were just as many poor Pākehā people as there were poor Māori people. And when I walked into a store in Christchurch, people came up and said, can I help you? 
But when I went to Masterton, it's like, here's the middle of town. All the Māori lived on one side in the block. And it was called the C block after the Dimutaka prison C block, because that's where all the cousins were. But the thing is, is that I would go into a store in Masterton and they wouldn't serve me. They would laugh at me when I went to ask after items of jewellery. I was trying to buy my mother a brooch for her birthday. And this was, so, <laughs> this was as an adult earning money. The police would push you up against the fence and, and try and shake you down and ask you where you've been. But I'd done, um, I know my rights at high school. So when they tried to do that to me, I looked at them and said, oh, excuse me, are you arresting me? If you're not arresting me, I'm not talking to you. But people in Masterton, Māori, would go, oh, 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 don't, don't do that. Don't rock the boat. And I realised that that's just the way it's always been. Our whanau had grown up conditioned to that this is the way it is, so that's just the way it is. We were the labourers. We were the shearers. We weren't the farm owners. Did that politicise you? Did you think, I'm going to do something about it? Oh, my it? mother politicised me when we grew up. She made sure, like, she voted for Mat Maturata. She made sure we knew about kaupapa Māori issues, but we were so far removed from it in Christchurch that it was a big thing to be aware of. Um, and I remember growing up in Christchurch and my best friend, my best friend looking at me and saying, after Waitangi Day and there's all these protests, when it was right in the middle of this big fervour, you know, honour the treaty, she looked at me and she goes, Marama, why do Māori have to be so greedy? Why can't they just accept what they have? I looked at her, I didn't know the answer. I knew I was offended. She wasn't asking to cause offence, so I also recognised that of her, but I didn't know the answer. And I think I sheepishly said, yeah, dumb. But I was so offended and I went home and every time I would talk to mum and she would make sure that that was never a question we ever had to worry about again. So when I got back to Masterton and saw the injustice of the way our people were being treated and that nobody did anything about it, I couldn't sit by and watch these things happen in our town and not say something about it. But by then I've got children, I was 16, 17 year old pregnant, um, young teenager, um, married my husband at 18 and so I went to Kohangareo in Masterton because I really didn't know anything else and I didn't want to be there, I was supposed to be at university but now I've got a baby so I went to Kohangareo and you know what, I said to John Key when he left because what he and Bill English, in fact Bill English more than him, what they did which is their legacy was change the face of politics by inviting the Māori Party to the table when they didn't have to. But what I said to him was that in the whakapapa of my father, I had an amazing education. But not until I went to Kohangareo, in the whakapapa education matauranga of my mother, was I opened to the world of our people. And when I can put that together and understand the systems and the policies, with a kaupapa Māori mindset, then we can make change. The Māori Party came to prominence at the 2005 election. In 2008, National Party leader John Key invited them to sit at the table of his new government. But supporting National would come at a cost. Did you recognise at the time, though, when the Māori Party agreed to go with the National Party, signed a confidence and supply agreement, that this could be the end because the National Party is not popular oh, in Māori nah, communities? you know what? I don't even care who sits at the table. I literally do not. People don't believe that of me. They think that's some sort of spin. But we've had the revolving chair of the red and blue for 150 years. We didn't screw it up. A hundred years of stupid politics from colonialist governments and their subsequent generations of people who believe what they believe because of those mistakes of the past is why we are here. What we can do, no matter who sits at that table, is influence, look them eye to eye and say, no, no, you don't get it. That's not gonna work. Because if they don't accept that unless they make change, we will not get change, then that's on them. 
not us. I don't care if it was national, and I certainly wouldn't care if it was Labour. They are two sides of the same coin. And if you look now, these Labour Māori MPs are hamstrung by their party policy. They're sitting in a Māori seat that was hard fought for, and if they don't stand up for our people while they sit in it, they should vacate it. Did you get that opportunity to look the National Party or Bill English or John Key over and again. eye when you were coming Over and again we looked them in the eye. Um, down to the wire over the Oranga Tamariki vulnerable children. I couldn't believe Hekia gave them that name. I was like, Hekia, what are you doing? I I vulnerable children? Why don't we call the Ministry of Health the Ministry of Sick and Dying People? All right, don't be stupid. You want to give it a name that is aspirational. Oranga Tamariki. So we got Oranga Tamariki tagged on so that it would give it an aspiration and now thankfully it's that but they haven't changed because they haven't changed the people. But over and again we looked them in the eye. With all of that did you know immediately as soon as Tariana walked away from the Labour Party that the Māori Party this is the party for me? Yeah I knew immediately as Peter Sharple was taken on board as the um, co-leader because I knew what Tariana did was courageous. I was there at the foreshore and seabed. I listened to Digga Karaudia from Wairua tell me the story when he looked those Labour Māori men MPs in the eye and said, Tāne mā, kai ngā wahine o raho. Because mm. here's our girl, we came to support her because she's standing up for us. And I lost all respect for those MPs who did not cross the floor with her that day. But when Peter Sharples came on board and the Māori Party was born, oh hell yes, because that was Kopapa Māori models of practice in action. That's what he stood for. Up there in the urban setting at Hawani Waititi with the first illegally started Kurukopapa in the country, Peter Sharples. I'd do that all day. Mm. All day. When Sir Peter Sharples became the co-leader, did you think I want to become an MP? I always knew I wanted to make changes, systematic changes for our people. Always, always. I could not stand to watch this, the inequity, this, the injustice. Don't treat me like that. How dare you? Just how dare you? Did you ever encounter any of that racism here in Parliament? Like blatant racism? Hmm. You know, casual racism, yeah, definitely. Unintentional because you just don't get it. Absolutely. It's in every aspect of everything. And Tolly, Oranga Tamariki, oh my gosh, I could have beaten my head against a wall over that. I was like, you don't get it because you don't get it. Like Bill was trying to get it. Anne was trying to get it, but not so much because they literally believed they knew what was best for us. I'm like, look at this legislation is racist. We can't support it. We tried so hard right up to the very last minute that they had to put it in the house to change those little words. We will make sure this child is put into a Māori whānau through whakapapa if it is practicable. All right, no, 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 no. That means you don't have to do your job. Can you tell me about that first week? Because I remember this really, really clearly. You challenged the parliamentary traditions. You didn't want to swear allegiance to the Queen. Fair enough on that. You voted for your cousin, Ron Mark, for Speaker, and you almost brought down the government. Can you tell me about that? Well, um, swearing allegiance to the Queen, I'm like, excuse you and yours swearing allegiance to the Queen. Why can't I swear allegiance to the treaty, the foundation document of our country? Excuse you. I like the Queen and all. She's a lovely old lady, but mm-mm. No. Anyway. Were you always planning to come in and shake it up like that? Oh, uh, no. I mean, that wasn't on purpose. It's just that's the truth. Mm. Literally. Don't ask me to abide by your racist, blinking tradition. Look at your traditions. They're founded in colonial practice. Is this not a house of the people? I'm the people. What, you don't recognise our founding document that allowed you to set this government up in the first place? And then um, Ron Mark, so Ron Mark's my cousin. It's the vote to see who's going to be the speaker. I don't know who these people are. I think I'm going to go vote for my cousin Mark. And then somebody calls a vote, said, OK, we're with National, we have this agreement, this is the first thing, I'd do what they do, pretty sure. 
And so I'd missed what they said, so I'm listening to these guys. I think I stand up and go, because Labour are going, we don't like you, go away. So I go, two votes opposed. And I sit down and go, whew, done. And then I get a phone call. And I've never had a phone call. I was like, oh, look at that. It's flashing. <laughs> Hello? I have no idea who's on the end of this phone, right? Hello? And it was our um, chief of staff, Helen Lee. And she goes, you voted the wrong way. And I went, oh, oh my gosh. She goes, you voted the wrong way. You were supposed to say two votes in favour. I went, oh, what do I do? She goes, you've got to stand up. You've got to say um, point of order. I'm like, oh, hell. So I put the phone down and I sheepishly stand up while they're counting the vote. And I say, um, point of order, Mr. Speaker. Um, I think I got that wrong. I should have said two votes in favour. And I sat down, I thought, oh, far, that was embarrassing. And then the whole place went up. All of Labour were like, yes, Marama. All of Nats are like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, no. And then the phone starts flashing again. And all of these Nats behind me are going, pick up the phone, pick up the phone. I'm like, hello. <laughs> and it was our chief of staff, she goes, I'm so sorry, you had it right the first time. I went, oh my gosh. And I hung up, I went, okay. Uh, point of order, Mr. Speaker. The phone just told me I had it right the first time. Two votes opposed. And I sat down, I could see all these cameras going click, 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 click. I was like, oh my gosh. So I quickly sent out a tweet, because I'm like, what am I going to do? Blame the staffer? No. So I sent out a tweet, just about brought down the government. Oops. <laughs> Steep learning curve, hashtag my bad. Mm. You mentioned the cameras clicking away there before. The media really warmed to you in your Eventually. term in Parliament. I wonder how that was received in the party itself. Oh, you know, I was far too mouthy for my own good. But I didn't care hmm. because we had one chance and one chance only. And the thing is, is when I first came in, uh, Tudor was fine. The thing, with me and him, I never said anything we had not first discussed, right? And I knew, like I'd say it in my own way, and sometimes that was a little too provocative for some people, but it wasn't against what we had agreed to. We could disagree in his office or my office, wherever we had our hui, but when we walked out, we were on the same page. And I used to say to people, whether by my mouth or the mouth of Tudor Flavel, it is the same. But eventually, I started taking the interviews because he got too busy as a new minister. And so we'd agree to something, and they go, oh, do you want to take this one? I'm going, yep, sure. And then eventually, I was the one they came to all the time. Mm. And it was easier to do. But the Māori Party had a love-hate relationship with the media. When you become the, the villain in the story instead of the one, the champion for the story, then that's hard to go home to. It's hard to get the tweets from. It's hard to get the hate mail from. And so if somebody in the media is p portraying you in that way, putting the ugly photo of you up in the paper or online or whatever, then that stuff's not easy to overcome. And so if you've had a few bashes like that as a politician, you're going to get them. Like, they're coming, just be ready. Then you do less media. But your workload as well would have been massive, not just as an MP but as a co-leader too, how did you actually deal with that? Oh, not well in the end. <laughs> At the beginning, pretty good. I mean, I, when I left here, I had to train myself to slow down. I couldn't slow my head down. I just could not slow down. I couldn't understand why people couldn't deliver stuff on the dot right now, please, now. I couldn't have a conversation with someone without talking at 100 miles a minute. I still like that a bit. But I mean, Tudor had his portfolios and he was busier than me. If hard work was the prerequisite for winning a seat, Tudor should have been the Prime Minister. I had a big workload because every other portfolio, which there are 63, he had his three, I had 60. I mean, I just had to be the spokesperson for all of them. And so I made the media come to us for a point of view. I was not going to have Māori issues stuck in the corner for the Māori issues category. Every issue is a Māori issue. If you're talking about climate change, that's a Māori issue. If you're talking about um, rates, tax, whatever, those are Māori issues. They have an impact on our people. There is always a point of view in every single piece of le legislation, and we just needed to know what that was. So non-stop from 7 in the morning to 11 o'clock at night, 
meeting after meeting after meeting, driving up and down the nation when you're not in Parliament, talking to our people. I knew what to say about these kaupapa because we'd already talked about it a million times in a million different ways and debated about it in our own offices, in our communities, with our people. In the 2014 election, the Māori Party only received 1.3% of the party vote, well below the 5% needed to enter Parliament. But with Te Ururo Flavel's electorate seat, it was just enough for Fox to get in. For her to be elected again, they'd need to achieve the same result, or Fox would need to win her own electorate. But election night delivered a shock loss. With that loss in Wairiki in 2017 when Tūruru lost to Tamati, that was a devastating loss. And I want to know whether you felt like you left here with some unfinished business. Uh, what was at the top of the I list? I mean, of course. We haven't changed the world yet. We still have disparities in health, education, um, offending rates, everything. Until we have, look, I said, yeah, OK, get rid of the Māori seats if you want to, when we have equality, when we have equity, when we no longer have the highest suicide rates in the world. Our children are choosing to end their life instead of live their reality. It has a wrong. So of course there's something to do. There's always going to be something to do. Is it me that has to do it? No. But does that mean that stops? No. We just go back home and do what we've always done and continue to do that in our own communities. Make change, whether we do it in this place formally or at home. It is the same. The difference is here you can make systemic change that eventually ripples down to our people. And when you change systems, then we have better outcomes. Going back to that 2017 election, was there any point when you realised that, uh-oh, I think we're not going to get back in? Oh, yeah. I knew. I felt like we were winning everything. Uh, and I'd go to meetings, right? And you can feel the room. You feel the room when you walk in. People like, oh, oh, happy day. Yes, here we go. And then when it wasn't, it was just, it was just under, it was. Labour were horrible. I'm sorry, Andrew Little was horrible. But as soon as Jacinda started to rise, I knew, I could tell. I walked in the room, I knew the, the, the fervour had changed. Did you have a sense, though, when the Māori Party went with National in that third and last term, did you have a sense back then that this could be the end? Yeah. I walked in and within a couple of weeks was asking to get away from National. Our people had had enough. And it didn't matter the gains we were making, they didn't know. And I see that better now at this end than I did at that end, even though I understood it then. Now I really do. The best chance we had was to move away from them. Who was pushing back and saying, no, we should stay? Oh, everyone. It's, it, it was deeply ingrained Māori Party philosophy. It's better to be at the table than not there at all. Huni didn't agree and left. I understood that concept, but politically I thought that was not the right move in this third term. Um, and so everyone pushed back against that. They said, no, over and over again, better be at the table, better be at the table, better to be at the table. So it was, you know, a fight against everyone in Did the end. Did it frustrate you? Because in hindsight, it's probably right. Did it frustrate you at the time? Um, at the time, look, I was new at the time, and I thought, well, I'm not going to win all these battles. I'm a brand new co-leader, and I tried never to stamp my co-leader foot and say no to it at all, but, 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 because he'd earned his stripes, you know, <laughs> and he had uh, the um, institutional knowledge and the history to understand things, right? But I do think that he is such a wonderful guy, and I'm loyal to him because he has so lovely, such high integrity, um, courageous, but really unpolitical. Does that make sense? Just, you know, he didn't want to play the political game and the Māori Party didn't want to play the political game. I just thought, we, you, we're in politics, guys. You have to. We can do it differently, but you still have to know. You still have to understand that if you want to get there, you've got to be there.
right? So there are a few things that came up along the way that really annoyed both Tudor and I and the party that we thought this might be the time to move. Did other Māori MPs from other parties reach out to you? It wasn't actually the Māori MPs, it was more the Bāgir MPs from other parties who knew that there was benefit in getting alongside us because we had influence, they didn't, to try and get... I mean, Jacinda did over the Oranga Tamariki Bill, um, Ian Les Galloway did over housing. Oh no, work safe, work safe. Um, and so people would come and get alongside us. So you got to know people and be friendly with them. But Tudoro said something to me on my very first day. It was almost the first thing out of his mouth, actually, apart from kia ora, was um, when they sit down and smile at you, they're not your friend. Tell them nothing. And he was deadly serious. I was like, wow, that stink. Like, really? <laughs> Can't be friends with anybody? And so I think there was a little stage, certainly towards year end of year two, where it became quite a lonely place because you just knew you couldn't trust people. Once I'd been bitten a couple of times when you think you can trust someone, I didn't do that anymore. Mm. Tūruki Delme has an interesting position on it. He says the worst enemy in politics isn't necessarily in the opposition, often it's in the same party. Was, do you, did you ever get that Oh, no, not feeling? in our party. Not with, no, not in our party. We had to be on the same page. I think me and Tudor all pretty much worked anything out. We could pretty much tell each other anything and be full frontal about our debates, absolutely. Um, so, no, I didn't feel that from him. It wasn't that so much as not enough time, like, you got to get out there, you got to do this, and I don't want to take this home to my family, and quite frankly, they didn't care. <laughs> Not didn't care, but it's like, you know, uh, what happened? And I'm going, da 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 and they go, okay. Right, it, it, it didn't quite get that. So it wasn't, you can't go home and debate that stuff at home. You, you need a sanctuary somewhere. So I didn't take that home. You couldn't trust people across the house, although I tried to, tried to develop those relationships because I wanted to get good policy through. I don't care if it was yours or Winston's or anybody's. And so, no, that circle of trusted friends became smaller, but it wasn't from within the party. Did it take a big toll on your whanau when you were gone for those yeah. three years? Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it pretty much broke us up. Like, my, we're not together anymore, but we cohabit and co-parent. We're just not together, my husband and I. Um, so yeah, it did. But of course, it started off, I tried to be home on a Friday night, gone on a Monday morning. But you're in Māori politics. Everything happens on a Saturday on the weekend at the hui, right? And so that didn't work. And then you're the co-leader. So it was across the entire nation, not just in your electorate. And so you've got to go to from uh, being right up the top of the country, right down to the bottom of the country and everywhere in between, because everybody's got a kaupapa that they want to put in front of you. And if they're Māori, they came to us. But there were some rules that were just dumb. Like uh, you only had certain number of um, times where your children could travel with you. But see, the public think, oh, look, she's swanning off to wherever with their kids in tow and rah, 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 rah. But that might be the only time you ever see your kids. So I'm never going to be bagging a politician about that ever again. When the 2017 election results came through, was that mamai for you? Did it feel personal? It was definitely mamai. And not just personally. I didn't, it wasn't like, oh my gosh, they didn't vote for me. They didn't vote for kaupapa Māori. And that was mamai. It's like, come on. Don't you get it? Did we not do a good enough job of helping you get it? Come on, our people. Can't even get you on the Māori roll. Can't even get you out to vote. Uh, why are we stuck in our apathy? That was mamai. I was like, come on. Have a look around. The things you moan about every single day are changed and determined in this place. That was mamai. I felt more personal grief for Tudor all then for myself. Because he was being bashed about personally. He didn't work hard enough. He wasn't in the rohe enough. He wasn't this guy, he wasn't that guy. He was trying to pull the wool over people's eyes and that's just not who he is. I felt for him and he felt betrayed. 
I felt our people didn't get it and that hurt. But Tūrero has done nothing but serve his people from day dot. I've worked in Kaupapa Māori with my family from day dot because that's the answer. And I think that hurt the most. I think we miss that voice now. So, yeah, I miss it but I'm glad to have the opportunity to set things right at home again. After that 2017 election, you compared Māori voters to battered wives. I wonder a year and a half on whether your view on that changed. Um, I was very specific in using those words because those were Tariana's words that she had used three years before when they lost what was supposed to be the safe Taihauauru seat. And I used those words for the same reason she used those words, and to highlight that it hasn't changed. It's not about being annoyed at the Māori public. It wasn't about lashing out at them and going, now nah, look at you, you're just like battered wife. A battered woman struggles to change under extraordinary oppressive circumstances, right? They try to hold on. They try to make incremental changes in their lives, believing and hoping that things will get better for them and their families. And it takes a long time for it to sink in that it's just not working. But that doesn't mean they don't try. That is not an accusation against our people. That is simply the way it is. We have been oppressed. There are many of our people who do not even know their language, don't know where they come from, and it's not their fault. They know they want something different. They're just not sure what it is because they have had their language stripped through racist legislation, not just because it was whipped at school, because the law made it illegal to use it in our education system. Here, this place created law that was racist, that oppressed our people, and that's the same mentality, right? That's not an accusation against our people that they're um, just not good enough because that is a horrible thing to think about battered women just quietly. They're awesome. They struggle, they rise, and they survive and eventually they thrive when they can get out from that cycle of oppression. And what we have not been able to do, the evidence is clear, still is to get out of that cycle of oppression or we would not still be in this place. And that's not the Māori Party's fault. Jeez, we were in government how many years? 10? That's a 100 years of racist and systemic social engineering through legislation. That's what that means. I haven't changed my opinion on that. That's the truth. Is there still an expectation on you, though, to represent the people? Do you feel that? Oh, people still ring me up. Some people haven't realised I'm no longer an MP. And I had to take myself off social media and off um, Facebook for many reasons, but that was one of them. And so, yeah. You know, people still reach out and, and want you to do that. I've what do they ask for? Um, mainly help with their kids being removed through SIFs. That is the biggest thing that comes to me over and over again. P, SIFs, criminal offending, housing. You know, there is so much to do still and people are still hurting. Homelessness hasn't gone away. Te Puia is still housing people. Thinking about those systemic issues, mm. And knowing that there isn't a lot of progress being made on them, a lot of progress hasn't been made on them over decades, would you consider coming back for oh, the Māori Party? Yeah, absolutely. I think I, I'm a little bit have the fever of it, but I actually think um, sometimes you have to be provocative. That's we were born out of protest, for goodness sake. Like to sit back now and say, oh, da 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 da, tikanga, and oh, da 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 da, you know, that's not the way we do things. Excuse you and yours. We were born out of protest. Kingi Tanga movement was born out of protest. We have been protesting the issues in this country from the day they arrived. Literally have. And sometimes you have to be provocative to push people's thinking. 
But if you're not provocative, if there's nobody there with that voice for us, where are we? Where do we go? Our people, I think, feel again now like they have no home to put their vote. And they went to Jacinda to change Nats, and I don't think anybody realised that the Māori Party would not be there. There are a few people who called it, a few people who did. But I think they wanted a change, but wanted us there. A lot of MPs, especially Māori MPs, after they leave Parliament, they struggle to re-establish their careers, and that takes a huge economic toll on them and their whānau. Can you tell us about what happened to you after you yeah, left Parliament? Yeah, I mean, that is absolutely true. It, it, especially if you've voted out and the government changes, because possibilities of a role that are appointed by government MPs after you've just been slamming them in the election, uh, you know, they fall away. You become unemployable. If you're mouthy and lippy like I had to be in order to get our point of view across, you know, that's not an attractive position for someone in a government department going, oh, we got Marum and Pop Fox, she's going to come work for the Ministry of Education. Or hell no, she not. Because I wouldn't be able to hold my tongue about some of the, you know, the things that they do. They know that. So that makes you unemployable. Um, trying to establish a company to walk the talk, to put houses on the ground, you know, to try and say, look, we can do this. Uh, and, and then we get done over by a dodgy guy, which now makes me look dodgy. You know, now I've got to rebuild credibility. Uh, and now I've got um, a strain on our family. We have had to sell our home. We've um, shifted the children. I'm literally homeless right now. I've got to live with my mother when I come back to New Zealand. I love you, Mama. But, you know, I'm grown. I was going to say I'm a grown-ass woman. And that's hard. So, yeah, absolutely that's been difficult. But it's not insurmountable. But it does take time because you have to let the water settle and then re-establish yourself slowly so that you can be employed again. I'd get a job at Mitre 10 tomorrow, but then I'd be in there trying to change the way they pack their shelves. Mm. What are you doing right now? Um, I'm actually studying at the moment. I'm doing a master's in um, indige applied indigenous knowledge through a wānanga. I was like, walk the talk. Come on, there's this whole elitism thing about what university you went to as well. I'm going to support our people and work in a cope up a Māori environment. But so that gives me breathing space. I think it's a little bit like Matidia, who's my cousin. She came to see me um, a few weeks back. And it's so good. In fact, Matidia is one of those people that I could lean on and have quiet conversations with. Chester Burroughs was another one who left Parliament and then struggled to find a role and a job. You know, Tauhenari, spoke with him a few times post-leaving. Same thing, that struggle to then re-establish yourself, try not to be so mouthy and get on with people again. Um, so, yeah, at the moment I'm studying, but I'm also dedicating my time at the moment to making sure my whānau are good and to re-establishing that connection uh, with my babies and to make sure, like, that uh, their teachers can say their name <laughs> and that uh, my baby who wants to be a black fern has every opportunity in front of her to do that. Is there a future, do you think, for a new Māori political movement? Oh, absolutely. Do you know what I am so excited by? I meet young people across this nation who have come out of kaupapa Māori education and others, but largely out of kaupapa Māori education and they are ruling their world. I have no fear for our future because our rising generation are awesome. Kia nei, me whakaritia mo mātou, ma mātou te take, te mahi, hei whakawāte te ara mo e nei nā ki a tupuake. E nei rangatahi, e nei penei jākoe, a nei te huarahi, kua patua kē te nei huarahi i a te puia, I a tari ana, i a pita, i a rātou katoa ko a hingātū ki te pō. I ngari anō ko te ao e heke mai nei nā koutou. We're in the home stretch of the interview and I just wanted to ask you... Are we? Because I could do this all night, but carry on. I wanted to ask you this as a mother and as a Māori woman. Mm. Why is it that you think so often Māori leaders are women? Disproportionately so. 
That's not true. To Where? Korea, to the Anaturia. Out of how many? Oh, the big leaders. So, oh, you say, so you think it's not true? It's not true. You said more Māori leaders are women. Mate, have you been to Iwi Chairs? They're like, thank you, Margaret Mutu. Like, yeah, oh, do it for us, girl. Get it. It's like, what the heck happened? You go to any government department, women are ruling those. Māori women are ruling those government departments. Go to schools, Māori women are ruling those things. Go to any little Māori corporate organisation, Māori women are everywhere. Go to the top seat. What happened? It's like, what? Because you, what? Kayakwe or Raho, you kataya te tu te kōrero? Please. I have to sit behind my cousin and sing his song? Mm. I'm like, is he going to speak on my behalf? Really? Are we going to have a conversation about women's issues right now? Or wait, shall I come and stand over here under the maho? Does that make you feel better? Like, come on. Our tikanga needs to evolve, and when it does, when it does, we will see those Māori leaders, women who are all there, actually take their place, actually rise. So yes, we have had historical, wonderful Māori women who were stunning orators and stunning um, bastions for our gender and our people, and it wasn't a different thing. But they are not the norm because their pathway to that position is not paved with roses, it's blocked by rahu, mm. just saying. I got that from my mother, never to rely on a man again, because look, this is what happened, and now I'm alone, and now I've got these kids to raise, and now I've got this job to do, and now I am live in the South Island, my whanau in the North Island, I've got to do it hard and on my own. And if you look around our country, our Māori women are doing it hard, on their own, with their children, in every community of this country. They're strong because they have to be. They got no choice. These boys who, who inseminate them and walk away, you know, come on boys, stand up, be there, be there. And then talk to me about who's good enough to be in charge. Because, you know, yep, we need good, strong male role models, but Māori women raise sons and they teach them, hopefully, to be good men. That's a good place to end us on. Fiery call to action. Yes. This program was made possible by the RNZ NZ On Air Innovation Fund.